So the, the first part of the talk will uh, present a, a general cognitive framework for uh, uh, introducing metacognition within overall theories of cognition, what's been called by, by Alan Newell and others unified theories of cognition that meant to account for the entirety of human cognitive processes, and presumably AI as well, and we can discuss that. Uh, uh, they've been implemented in, cognitive, uh, in computational form as cognitive architectures. Uh, and there seems to be, I'll review a bit of a consensus emerging in cognitive architectures towards what's called the common model of cognition. And I'll, I'll give my current take of where metacognition and other things that are sort of at the edge of that, that consensus uh, are, are situated. And then I'll describe three applications instantiating that general idea within the ACTA cognitive architecture to, to give some idea of the, the kind of characteristics that we want to end our cognitive systems with from a metacognitive perspective. Uh, here's a cognitive architecture that I've been involved with for the bulk of my career. It's called ACTAR. Uh, it's strongly constrained by cognitive psychology and the kind of experimental results that have been derived over the year by cognitive psychology. Uh, it consists of a number of buffers that are associated with brain areas that interact in constrained ways. Uh, it integrates symbolic knowledge and symbolic reasoning with sub-symbolic uh, statistical uh, adaptive processes, uh, especially for memory and, and action selection. Uh, it's not a normative architecture, so it can reflect individual differences, cognitive biases. Uh, uh, Paolo was part of a project we had about modeling a range of cognitive biases. Uh, and it can account, of course, it has online learning processes that can account for things like the effect of training. Uh, so it covers a fairly broad range uh, of, uh, of, of human activity. Uh, and uh, when Alan Newell at Carnegie Mellon uh, uh, kick-started that program of research in cognitive architectures in his famous talk, You Can't Play 20 Questions with Nature and Win, so you cannot try and account, develop uh, uh, specific models for specific aspects of human cognition and hope that at the end of the day they will all magically converge. Rather, you have to start from a common ground, from an architecture, and he borrowed the idea of architectures from hardware architectures, uh, and then build from the ground up. Uh, this graph is from a review of 40 years, now 50 years of cognitive architecture by John Sosos and colleague, where he traced the history of cognitive architecture starting again from the, uh, from the origin, even before Newell's call. Uh, and various types of architecture, hybrid, neural, uh, symbolic, uh, lays out the kind of capabilities that they include and the kind of applications that they've been made of. So again, that, 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 that means to be, have very broad coverage of human activity from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, recently, I've been involved in an effort that was initially called the standard model of the mind by analogy to the standard model in particle physics. And now, uh, under community input, we call it the common model of cognition. And that's a joint project that started when uh, John Laird and Paul Rosenblum, uh, who were originally involved with Newell in the development of his SOAR architecture, and myself that have been involved in the ACTA architecture, and Paul Rosenblum has more recently developed an architecture called Sigma on the same idea. And we realized that even though those architectures, and you can see the SOAR diagram there, the ACTA, uh, the ACTA diagram, the Sigma diagram, even though they look very different and the implementations have made a number of choices that were very specific, then in fact they had converged on the same general picture of the human mind, or human-like mind, as we say, because we want to include the possibility of, of AI architectures that are similar but not identical to human cognition, that it had converged on the same general structure 
and uh, the, the same basic assumption. So we started codifying that and trying to involve the cognitive architecture community into buying into that, that view that really defines the incremental progress that's been made in the field and that lays the, the groundwork for, for concerted progress rather than everybody living in the silo of their own architecture and not talking to anybody else. Uh, and that's the, the, the general picture there, the general diagram, and that can seem a little bit obvious, right? You have obvious things like working memory, declarative and procedural long-term memory, perception and action. Uh, a number of much more detailed assumptions about the grain scale of processes, how those various uh, uh, modules interact with each other, what the learning processes are, and so on and so forth. Uh, I won't go in detail, uh, but uh, we did a uh, uh, little regression analysis that shows that indeed there's been considerable progress in the last 25 years in this space of assumptions about gradually learning in that what potentially is a very complex space of the possible design of intelligence architectures, what actually maps to the nature of human cognition and what doesn't. Uh, one exercise that can be very enlightening to show that yes, it's not just a boxology and some arrows that, that seem reasonable, is my colleague Andrea Stocco has done a a lot of work trying to validate uh, the common model of cognition against brain imaging data. So there had already been work mapping those various uh, modules of the common model uh, onto parts of the, the brain. And now what the common model really uh, provides uh, is a pattern of connection uh, between the, the, those various brain areas. And it's not obvious that that pattern of connection is the right one. There have been a number of other competing structures proposed uh, in the architecture, uh, in, the, in the literature, both in terms of hierarchical models or hub and spoke models of various connectivity. So what Andrea did uh, is take the data from a la very large uh, uh, open science project called the Human Connectome Project that gathered a very large amount of high quality neuroimaging data on a variety of tasks and essentially use a statistical technique called dynamic causal modeling to estimate the probability that the pattern of temporal activity between the brain regions fit the various models that were, that were proposed. And it turns out that the common model accounts much better than the competing ones uh, for the data that's been observed. Uh, so I think that that's a, a path there toward validating the, the idea that the consensus that has emerged largely under constraints of psychological behavioral data as well as uh, AI type uh, uh, functional constraints actually maps to the structure of the human mind. So recently, we've talked about extending the common model to new capabilities. And we started with emotions because that's a part of the uh, cognitive science that often hasn't been integrated in cognitive architectures. And in the process of adding a module for emotions, we realized that some aspects of human behavior that have been accounted as emotions, such as, for example, appraisal theory, really had a metacognitive flavor to them. And that's why we, we, we felt the need, and that's still ongoing work, to add a metacognitive uh, uh, module that uh, basically balanced the emotion module. And there is potentially a really interesting uh, unification there on the architecture between perception, emotion, and metacognition. If you think of perception as categorizing the inputs that come into the brain from the external world, you can think of emotion similarly as categorizing the physiological state of the body. And then you can think of metacognition as categorizing the state of brain processes within the brain itself. So as perception looks at the world, uh, emotion looks at the body, metacognition looks at the brain itself. But those are fundamentally similar sources of information for the overall cognitive architecture. 
as part of the common model uh, uh, program, which we mean very much to be not a top-down driven, but a community process of uh, formalizing the consensus that has been reached, we've had a number of meetings, including at the uh, AAAI Fall Symposia, and one of these meetings featured a working group uh, uh, devoted to metacognition. And uh, it formalized the, the stats, the paper there that you can find online, and there's a citation at the end. Uh, and, and it tried to formalize the knowledge because metacognition is a very broad and somewhat shapeless area with lots of different aspects that don't really seem to fit very well together. So they tried to integrate the, the results that were known from the, the cognitive science perspective. Uh, and you can see that it's generally assumed to involve multiple stages from monitoring uh, of cognition, the world out there. Paolo gave a good example. Hey, the world seems to be constantly changing here. What do I do with that? To all the way to modulation and control. How do I change, for example, my knowledge representation or my distribution to reflect that? Uh, it's interesting to inquire as to the nature of these various processes. And from a cognitive architecture perspective, if all the stages are symbolic, then you can sort of say, well, that's just cognition as usual. And if all the stages are sub-symbolic, that is statistical and automatic, well, that's just the system operating on its own. So it seems that the key characteristics of metacognition to be a mix of those symbolic and sub-symbolic. So for example, you get a signal from your brain that, hey, something is different here, or something uh, may not be succeeding, or something, I almost get it, but I don't have it. And then you engage your reasoning processes, for example, to try and reconfigure your representation, or do something different, try a strategy to do something different. Uh, one potential problem from an architectural perspective, I like to call, talk about the wall of church and state in cognitive architectures, in that you have a symbolic level, which you can think of as sort of conscious reasoning, conscious cognition, and you have a sub-symbolic level that determines how every one of these symbolic level uh, acts uh, actually uh, perform. So for example, retrieval from memory is dictated by the activation calculus that reflects a, a Bayesian weighting of a number of factors that actually determine which particular fact you retrieve, or similarly, which decision you make. And if you allow that, that at the symbolic level, knowledge of all that statistical level, it's fairly intractable, and then it risks uh, invalidating all the regularities that have been captured at a statistical level. So it's sort of, it's quite dangerous to allowing the system to introspect on itself and essentially potentially fall into all sort of circular traps. So that's the question we'll explore here is how much introspection do you want to allow by the symbolic level into the sub-symbolic level? Uh, and to do that, uh, I'll go into a few examples to illustrate the kind of solutions we're looking at. Uh, first of all, how am I doing on time? Is anybody keeping time? Uh, okay, great. So, so the, the first one is, and I think that that's very uh, uh, logical when we're talking about uh, uh, combining symbolic and sub-symbolic statistical information, is to look at it from the perspective of neurosymbolic models. About a decade ago, we got involved with trying to combine ACTAR with a neural architecture called Libra. And we started doing that as part of the, the DARPA BICA program, uh, Biologically Inspired Cognitive Architectures, when we realized that the, the Libra architecture had developed a modular structure to account for the structure and the anatomy of the human brain that was actually quite similar to the structure that ACTAR had developed looking at psychological data from a, from a behavioral perspective. So, so that opens a lot of potential hybridization approaches. And the first approach was, of course, to 
to do a, a sort of a modular swap there to say, well, I'm going to replace the, the, the actor vision module, which is primarily a, a theory of attention and that doesn't actually do all that much in terms of pattern recognition, with the Libra vision module, which was a fairly detailed representation of the human visual cortex, uh, at least from a structural point of view, and essentially try to endow a, a largely symbolic architecture with uh, uh, neural processing. And that turned out to be very good, very quickly, uh, a, a very uh, uh, productive collaboration where you have the symbolic control of the cognitive architecture, but then you have the kind of capabilities that have become very popular with convolutional neural networks in terms of pattern visual pattern recognition. Uh, one problem, there's the interface of the system. You can sort of pre-train the visual module to output particular categories of objects and link those to symbolic representation uh, in the cognitive models, but the visual module is forced to output one of those categories. And sometimes it's a bad fit. Sometimes it's something that doesn't really look like uh, the object that has been trained in that particular category. But it doesn't know that. It just sort of forces the output. So the first thing that we looked at is looked at the dynamics of the neural network and tried to see if we could extract sort of some quantity from those dynamics that could allow us to tell whether or not the recognition had really been successful. And we, we trained a classifier to do that, and that, that, that was one particular approach. But it just sort of gives you one number there that's fairly core. So we tried a, a somewhat more sophisticated approach, which is to introspect in the next to last layer. So you can see here, just like the human visual cortex, is that you have a gradual process of abstraction all the way to the winner take all sort of categorization naming. So what we did, we introspected into the next to last layer that has fairly high level uh, features, but that are still distributed, uh, took that vector and represented it uh, together with the, the object uh, categorization that had been made into the actor memory, into the actor episodic memory. So that with each object, with each category of object that are represented as a set of instances in memory, you had the, the, the pattern there of representation. Now what you can do when you got a new object is to say, well, given this category, let's say that's a fish, is its representation at this level consistent enough with the other representations for fishes? And if it is, then you, are, you accept the categorization that was made by the visual layer, visual module, but if it's not, then you can say, you can start reasoning, say, well, maybe it's a new category of objects. So what we did here is uh, the, the, the cognitive architecture would create a new category, create a new output unit with that category, and then start training the visual module to recognize that new category. And we had fairly good results of being able to do completely unsupervised learning of new object categories that had never been seen before, that were never labeled, just based on that introspection, on that metacognitive introspection deep into the representation itself. And then you can do things like uh, other things, like try to uh, provide top-down patterns uh, that learn, for example, statistical regularities of the location of objects uh, to guard the processing itself. Uh, so recently, we were part of another DARPA program called Explainable AI, where we try to, to take that view forward and uh, to try to address the problem of explaining the operations of, for example, deep learning reinforcement learners uh, to human users. And the key insight there that we try to apply is that uh, explanation is fundamentally an adaptive process. Uh, 
as the teacher, for example, explains things to their students, they factor in the level of knowledge to the student, and they don't always explain things in the same way. Once a common ground has been established, then they can explain things in a more complex way, in a higher level, and then gradually fill in the gap. So that's what we try to do, build a common ground between the learner, i.e. the deep learner, the AI, and the human user, uh, and uh, what we did there is to maintain a model for both of them. And that's sort of an interesting idea there that cognitive models were developed for representing human cognitive processes. So there was sort of a reasonable argument for, for developing a, a model of the human user. And that had been done for a number of years, for example, in intelligent tutoring systems. But we decided that there was, as we saw there by the analogy between ACTAR and the neural uh, Libra architecture, that there is enough of an analogy, a mapping there between the representation, the ACTAR architecture, at that abstract level of symbolic, sub-symbolic representation, and the representation of a deep learner such that we could have parallel uh, uh, models and the explanation would be driven by the discrepancy between the two models. And that's essentially that process of refining as you get to know more and more things about the user and the deep learner by observation and as we'll see by some introspection uh, that you refine these models and you drive the explanation by the discrepancy between the models. And uh, you can make an argument that the, feat, the, the processing of, so this is a deep reinforcement learner, that there is some level of analogy between those stages of processing and the stages of cognitive processing such that you can frame your explanation in sort of human cognitive terms, in terms of a naive human user would understand, in terms of attention, in terms of representation, in terms of decision making, or the UAV hadn't seen the mountain, meaning that it hadn't categorized the mountain as an obstacle, for example, those kind of things. Uh, so we build the cognitive models uh, from observation using uh, an approach called instance-based learning that's been used fairly broadly to account for, for human decision-making. Uh, and uh, we can also introspect, as we did for Libra, uh, into the representation of the deep learner using techniques like, like TSNE to try and, and bring a little bit more information than just the pure behavioral observation. So uh, to explain what's happening in that complex processing there, we developed a measure called cognitive salience, which is a way of essentially extracting from the cognitive model a measure, for example, of how salient various features were in making a decision. Uh, here's a quick example of, of how we applied this. So that was a simple task in StarCraft called the Beacon task, which is you have a little agent there, and it has two potential targets, beacons, a, a green beacon and an orange beacon. And the task is very simple, learn which beacon has the higher reward. And that's fairly straightforward. The orange beacon is, is more valuable than the green beacon, so that it can learn very quickly. One thing that it doesn't learn, interestingly enough, is in the few cases when the less valuable beacon is in the way of the more valuable beacon, clicking on that beacon will lead the agent to walk into the less valuable beacon and obtain the less desirable output. And it does that consistently, and we sort of wondered why. Why hasn't it learned that? Well, the answer is it hasn't learned it because there was not even enough of these examples in the training set, because the natural occurrence of just the three of them being lined up is rare enough. It had never bothered to, 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 to learn that. But, but we are certain that, so here's the TSNE uh, introspection into the representation, again, the last layer, like the analog of the IT layer in the, the Libra vision module. And you can see this is the case where just the green beacon was presented, so that was the best target. Here's the cases where the orange beacon was presented. But you can see that the cases where they were both present 
are overlaid with those cases when one is blocking the other. So it hadn't learned to, re to, to, to extract the representation there to make that distinction. And that's something that we could uh, uh, use the cognitive salience measure to analyze. We develop, we look, the cognitive model learned to represent the decisions of the deep learner. And we could analyze the cognitive model and indeed find that it hadn't learned that blocking feature. So, so that's an example there of, of trying to sort of, uh, use metacognitive measures like the salience of particular features to explain the behavior of, in this case, a deep learner. Uh, the, the last example I, I will mention is uh, uh, an application to, to cyber defense uh, and the idea of personalized deception, the fact it can be useful to present information that can sometimes be deceptive. But then you cannot be deceptive all the time, so that brings up the issue of trust. Uh, the simple experiment had six targets with different values and penalties and probability of monitoring, so you could compute an expected value. Uh, and some of the time they were, they were covered, but what you wanted to do is give a signal, a warning signal to try to keep attackers away that was partly deceptive, that also uh, was given when the targets were not covered. And the question is, well, how to optimize that signal to make maximum use of the trust that the user would have in the signal? So we develop, again, an instance-based model that just sort of observes the, well, that just learns by making decisions, accumulating those decisions, and making future decisions by using the cognitive architectures to generate expectations, like expectations of how successful this particular attack would be, given the various features of the target, reward, penalty, monitoring, probability. Uh, and so it's fairly straightforward logic. Select the target based on these features. You get a signal, and then you made a decision basically based on the signal that could be deceptive. Uh, but uh, So the, the cognitive model accounts, and again, that's where we get back to the bread and butter of cognitive architecture of accounting for human behavior. We gave four blocks of 25 trials, and you can see that the cognitive model does a very nice job of reproducing the behavior of the, of the human user. It also represents the distribution. So this is the probability of attack for 100 different human users. And you can see it goes from users who attack all the time to users who are much more circumspect and all only attack when they don't get a signal, are much more careful. And uh, uh, the, the, those cognitive processes, those sub-symbolic processes, are statistical, they're stochastic. So they can give you very, the same model starting point give you very different uh, behaviors emerging from the experience. Sometimes they're lucky and they'll get to attack more and more. Sometimes they're unlucky and they'll be more shy. And we can see the natural distribution of model behavior matches the distribution of human behavior very well at the individual level, not just uh, in the average. Uh, and that's a model that we developed before we had any data. So that's not machine learning, that's not data fitting, that's just the model generating the, it, it, its own behavior. Uh, it can apply, it can match different conditions when they have more information, when they don't get a warning at all. Uh, and then you can use the model as synthetic subjects. So our colleagues tried to develop various ways of generating a deceptive signal. The original signal was uh, derived from game theory, Stackelberg, Optimum. They tried various ways, and every time the cognitive model could predict how humans would react to it. Uh, so as I mentioned, the different runs of the model can account for different individuals. Uh, that raises the issue, well, can, how do you select the particular model run to fit a particular human user? Uh, we use a technology called model tracing, which is essentially a way of aligning the model, in this case, fairly straightforwardly by just giving it the same experience, since it's an instance-based learning model. And you can see with the same experience of decision that the model learns to, to approximate the, that particular human very well, a 95% uh, correlation in probability of attack at the individual level. Uh, 
And you can, here we use that cognitive salience method that I described for explainable AI to introspect in the model and figure out like the various model runs were more sensitive to each of these features. So for example, some runs more, were more focused on the reward and tended to attack targets that had higher rewards whereas some were more focused on penalty or probability of monitoring and tended then to be more, more circumspect and all, only attack targets that had a, a lower probability of being monitored. Uh, so just like we did before, you can introspect in the cognitive model. And in this case here, we computed essentially a version of the trust that the user had in the signal. And then you, we, we uh, try to optimize the cost and benefit of, do you want to give a deceptive signal now, uh, knowing that if the subject attacks, that it will realize that the signal was deceptive and may lose its trust in the signal that will then be, need to be rebuilt by giving only a truthful signal, or do you want to exploit it and run that risk? Uh, the introspection into the cognitive model is essentially a closed form way of solving the, that benefit and optimizing the signal ba based on that introspection. And our initial results were somewhat disappointing when we put that optimization in closed loop by the human until we realized that a subcategory of the subjects as per uh, questionnaire given afterward did ignore the signal entirely. So we created two versions of the model, a version that, uh, the original version that paid attention to the signal and another version that ignored the signal. And you can see now that the two versions of the model fit the two uh, categories of subjects perfectly. Uh, so quickly wrapping up, uh, uh, so, so we think from this perspective that, that metacognition provides cognitive systems with desirable characteristics, as Paolo sort of mentioned in his introduction, robustness, open-ended learning, and some version of bounded optimality, as we saw here. And it can be added to cognitive architectures by introspecting into the processes, things like memory retrieval and action selection, and making that action available in some cases to external optimizers or to general cognitive processing. And some of these measures include sort of measures of consistency associated with correctness probability, as we saw in the first example. How, how likely is it that, that that force categorization is actually the right category of object? Uh, cognitive salience, either of features or specific instances, can be used to optimize the representation. Which features should I pay attention to? Which features can I ignore? Which features should be added to augment the representation? And finally, measures of trust, and I think particularly uh, relevant in building human machine uh, system, can be used to calibrate and optimize the reliance on sources of information and sources of automation. And here are some references to, to the work that I mentioned. Thank you. <laughs>